Hello everybody and welcome to Hard Talk. We have a very special show in store for you today. We will take a look at the oil industry from a sociological perspective. We have three expert guests joining us today. The first you may remember as the author of the Communist Manifesto, the father of dialectical materialism, Karl Marx. Hey, thanks for having me, America. I usually don't get much of an audience out here. Well, you're always welcome here at Hard Talk, Carl. Also joining us is the father of functionalism, Emil Durkheim. It's actually Emily now, Jack, but thank you for having me. Sorry about that, Emily. And our third guest is one of the most prominent figures in conflict theory, Max Weber. Actually, Jack, it's Max Weber. Sorry about that, Max. All right, on to our first issue. Have you guys been following the recent developments in the oil industry? Absolutely. Well, of course. Duh. All right, well, let me show you what's going on in the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota. Williston is located on the western edge of North Dakota. Two miles underground sits the Bakken Formation, a deposit of crude oil the size of West Virginia. Two new inventions, hydrofracking and horizontal drilling, have given oil companies new access to the Bakken and unleashed a drilling frenzy. 2,000 new wells are going in this year, and when fully developed, an estimated 40,000 wells could cover the region. Drilling spread faster than anyone expected. Now, starting with the control over the stash of oil on the Gulf Coast, 727 million barrels to be exact, there was a clear outrage earlier this summer when the president tapped into these reserves. The president's explanation for this was to sustain the higher rates of working class families participating in summer recreation and travel. How do you feel about that, Carl? You know, Jack, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you, that stash of oil is the modern Swedish bank for capitalists in our society. They've pulled a valuable resource and stashed it away from the working class with full intention of expending it at their leisure, specifically when the demand is so high that their profit margins will grow substantially. Of course, the capitalists became upset when the president made the right decision to give some of the structure back to the individual. He took the control they need to have over so social structure. I mean, come on. We're talking about a citizen's basic need for transportation in today's modern society. What is your take on the actions of the president, Emily? I agree with you, Marks, on most of what you said. However, you're missing some important details. This needed to happen, not so much for a shock to the capitalist control over social structure, but more as a social solidifier. All of us tend to see summer as a time for recreation. The trips and memories that we have from our summers are something we all hold sacred, and there should be more of a focus on them. There is a belief that we should be able to practice this ritual that has become part of our society as a whole. The role of the commander in chief should be to enforce just justice, and I feel like he did so in this situation. Interesting. Max, what's your opinion on the matter? This is a bold move by Obama. I, I believe that his way of legitimizing it to the masses by leaning on the custom of people spending a portion of their summer to enjoy traveling was a smart idea. He understands that the people have to have a belief in authority and have to feel as though they put him in office for a reason. This move helps people stay connected in a traditional sense, but as I'm sure Obama has realized, this move goes against the written rules that were in place by the bureaucrats we elected, who clearly became perturbed by what they believed to be an irrational choice on his part. He knew this was not solely his property, but he used it to control the market anyway. Well, there's clearly not a lack of opinion in this group. Now let's shift gears here. We're talking about the middle class going on vacation, but we have to address that significant portion of our middle class works in the oil industry. A prized resource is discovered in the Dakotas. Workers flock to the site. A town booms. Extra income leads to extra trouble, and for some, an unhappy ending. There are striking similarities between the gold rush of the 19th century and the oil rush of the 21st. One of those similarities, there is folklore, and then there are the facts. 2011, I got a call from a friend 
and uh, I was kind of, you know, my family was kind of in a financial situation, and I got a call from a friend. He said, I'm working for a company, and uh, we're out in Williston, and, and it's a good job, um, good money, good pay. So Darren Hassel signed on and went to work, long hours in the Bakken, making more money than he ever thought possible. You have individuals that literally make seven, $8,000 a month. At least, you got guys out there, directional drillers, make 120, 160,000 a year. In regards to labor, nearly one million Americans work directly with oil and gas industries. And a total of 10 million jobs are associated with that industry. The fact is, these jobs have boosted our economy 300 to 400 billion dollars annually. Without this boom, we would most likely still be in a recession. My question to you theorists is, how do you feel about this boost in jobs, and is this movement good or bad for our economy? Let me start with your question on whether or not the oil boom is good for the economy. Quite simply, yes, Jack, it is. The results are clear about that. This $100 billion a year influx into our economy is good for it, but this topic is a double-edged sword for me. It has created this influx of quote-unquote middle-class jobs that do indeed provide citizens with a livable salary. But I'm telling you, Jack, it's just an illusion. This is truly alienation at its core. We all know these jobs will not last for long. And when that time comes, get ready to see some class conflict emerge. When the realization of the proletariats, who I promise you will, un will soon understand they are covertly being suppressed until they become conscious. From this realization, we will see societal change. Overproduction of oil on United States property will lead to a larger class of proletariats who will become conscious. We'll see a class in itself that will become a class for itself. And Emily, what are your thoughts? Well, Jack, with this oil boom, we can see the progression to an organic society. With high structural differentiation and complexity of the system that has created benefits for the jobs directly connected to the oil industries has also allowed the functioning of other industries such as housing, retail, manufacturing, construction, and one of the most important, education, to take on the purpose society requires of them. While this is good for the functioning of society, this has a high chance of impairing our solidarity as a collective. People see this as an opportunity to take advantage of which initiates them to move from different cultures throughout the state and bringing into this one area. This is too much differentiation in a short period of time. This desecration of the collective consciousness will be pointless in the short run of a lucrative oil boom. The wells that are drilling over the, in the Bakken are super high producers right away, but have a very steep decline. This will lead to more of a traditional capitalism than a rational capitalism because the soil boom will not last forever, meaning that this is something to maintain the lifestyle people have become accustomed to. You all bring up some very logical points. At this point, we'd like to show you the second half of the prior video of Darren's perspective of the dark side of the soil boom. But he soon discovered that the high paychecks came with a high cost. I mean, there's a lot of aspects of oil field life that people will never understand. Long days, lots of hours. You put in 105 hours a week, I remember doing that. Like many workers, Darren left his family behind. He was fortunate to find housing in a man camp, known officially as workforce housing. Clean and comfortable, but the rooms are small. No visitors are allowed. Your coworkers are your only contacts. 40 out of 52 weeks of a year, you are all you have for each other. You know, phone calls to your wife and kids, yeah. But the physical absence of anything that really matters in your life, it's very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. And so you really have to come to trust and rely on the people around you, even though you don't know them from anybody when you get there. I mean, the bars are more than willing to take them in, the strip clubs, things like that, because, you know, hey, there's lots of money there. There's instances where, you know, you know, meth and other drugs are sold, but you just, you lose sight of what's real. I mean, it, it's just, you know, you're away from your family, you're away from what matters. You just start to make decisions that don't matter, you know, and you end up hurting the people you love and they suffer because of it. 
I had to respect and honor the fact that my family was struggling. What we're seeing here are long hours and dangerous working conditions. I'd like to pose the question to you all. Why do these people continue to have this internal drive for money overthrow the concern for their well-being? Well, Jack, people are going to these oil fields because they are suffering from false consciousness. In capitalism, the proletariats are pitted against one another. They must compete amongst one another to survive. To maintain their economic system, capitalists pushed a multitude of different ideologies on the proletariat. The best way to describe this occurrence is through my concept of commodity, commodity fetish. Commodity fetish occurs in capitalism because capitalists own the means of production. As a result, the proletariat is not aware of their true relation to their product. They come to view their products as something separate from them, something to be bought. When this happens, their lives come to be defined by what they purchase rather than community relations, which is why we see people leaving their families to live in the harsh conditions of North Dakota rather than live with their families and communities. This is a perfect example of the Protestant work ethic at its finest. Darren is going over there to make money for his family. He puts up with horrible working conditions, long hours, and illegal activity for an enormous paycheck in hopes for a better life in the future. Oil workers today are the Protestant workers of yesterday. Protestants maintained a work ethic of a capitalistic society. They would work extremely hard and live very frugally in hopes for salvation later on. This is exactly what oil workers are doing nowadays. They live with five other grown men in a room built out of plywood, surrounded by drugs and strippers, working 12-hour shifts in the burning sun or frigid winters. They keep their heads down, grinding it out each day in hopes for salvation one, time, one day. Although salvation may not be heaven, getting out of the conditions of an oil field are about as close as you can get to heaven. The thing that really shocked me about Darren's interview was that people are working over 100 hours a week. This is clearly a forced division of labor with a lack of justice. The fact that this population of mistreated oil workers is growing so quickly, I can tell you the system is not going to be able to keep up. This should be a major worry for us because these oil fields are incubators for a state of anomie. The other issue I have with, the, with how capitalist greed is creating a lack of justice, people deserve to get equal pay for equal work. And considering this boom will be short-lived, I don't see how someone's life is worth having a six-digit income for a couple years. Our producers just brought to my attention some footage that coincides with the concepts you all have been talking about. The rapid growth has strained all of Williston's public services. More people means more crime, and the police find themselves struggling to keep up. Looked just like the Batmobile, like for real, and it was swerving all over the road and it was speeding. And so when he pulled them over, the guy actually got out of the vehicle and had the Batman outfit on. We kind of call it like a mini Vegas. Officers are getting DUI crashes at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning, as well as Wednesday afternoon during lunch. The boom hit so fast that the city's still playing catch up. So we have a lot of people getting off the bus that come to the police station and ask, well, where's your Salvation Army? Where's your churches that let people stay there? And there really is nowhere to stay. We even had an instance where there was a lady who couldn't figure out why her heat wasn't working, and when they came to fix it, they pulled the skirting off and there was a family living underneath their trailer. If I'm having a really bad day or I think about the problems in my life and I come to work, I feel normal. <laughs> While the town scrambles to catch up to the boom, workers moving to Williston face their own set of challenges. I chill, I smoke fake weed, and I play video games. This is Tommy. It's noon on his day off, and he's wasted. Back in Michigan, I can buy a can of smoked oysters for 99 cents. Here, it's a dollar 40 something. <laughs> no, I'm never happy that I came out here, but there's money here. Any of the bad stories you hear about Willis, North Dakota, they aren't the locals. They're people that have come here to work. If you ask me if I have a cigarette for you, and I have a full pack, and I tell you I don't have a cigarette for you, what does that mean? I don't want to live in North Dakota. It's flat, it's dirty, it's dusty. They got rough winters, they got rough summers. I mean, out of all the places in America, North Dakota is probably one of the godforsaken places I'd ever want to live. I've missed my birthday, I missed my wife's birthday. School's gonna start on the 5th and I'm gonna miss the first day of school for my uh, kindergartner. 
I'd rather assure they have a home to live in and their bills are paid rather than being there for the moments. It's responsibility, I guess. Because there's nowhere to live, temporary housing developments for oil workers have sprung up all over North Dakota. These man camps are filled with men who depend on big oil, whether or not they support the industry. I'm making real good money, most money I ever made in my life. I'm blessed. Place to stay, place to eat. Can't be more satisfied. I got into it in my 20s, and I'm in my 50s now. I've been married 32 years, but she's used to me working. I talk to her every night. We do the Skype and that kind of stuff so we can see each other. People bow down to it because oil is what makes the money, you know, but I'm just, I'm different, man, you know. I, I don't, I don't, I hate it. I'm not going to be here alone. Our government right now is kind of anti-oil, blocking all their permits and stuff like that on federal lands, which is stupid, but that's just my opinion. It's bad for everybody. It kills everybody. I, everybody in my family I know is eat up with lung cancer and stuff like that from working in the oil field. You know, I think the people that are against it is uh, a minority of people. It's a hard living. Think twice about it and go to college and get some kind of degree <laughs> where you don't have to work like this, you know? They're drilling safer than they ever had, so there's no reason not to drill. Why do you work in oil? All the only thing I can do to make money. It sucks. You know? Well, all right, guys, that's all we have time for today. Thanks for coming in. Hey, happy to stop by, Jack. Pleasure was all mine, Jack. Thanks for having me. Why say shades of gray? Why be alone? Try another Soma. Soma! Life's good. Shut up.